long time now, they've been coming home. Home, the good old USA. Down deep, they were all civilians when they left. Down deep, they're still civilians. Still the same farmers and clerks, the same mechanics and salesmen, the same lawyers and schoolboys and truck drivers that you knew when they went away. Soon, they'll be civilians, in fact. They'll make the readjustment all right. They'll fit in. But right now, well, don't be misled by that happiness overseeing the good old USA. And yet, behind those smiles is the realization that America is not a land of regimentation, but a land of individuals. And that means individual problems of readjustment. More often than not, those who are the most concerned about their futures are those who have the most to offer their communities. These young doctors, for example, ever since the day they entered medical school, they've been developing a scientific outlook, accustoming themselves to looking carefully ahead, training and being trained against making any false steps. But now the signposts for the future aren't so clear. Home safe and sound, sure. But what lies ahead? This young chap, for example, how much has he forgotten about surgery in the last three years? And this one, he had a nice little practice started once. Is it still there? What about office space for this man and his buddy here? He has a wife and a youngster. He's not at all sure he can find a home for them. Some doctors, like this one, saved a little money in the service. But will it be enough to get set up again? Is the readjustment going to be easy or tough? Perhaps the sensible thing would be to go back to school. Yes, their world has changed since they left. Somehow it's more of a puzzle now. Maybe it'll be wise to look around a bit. Surely there must be opportunities left for every one of them. Opportunities? Opportunities for doctors in post-war America? Never in all history have the opportunities been so great. There's a world that needs healing, and American doctors must take the lead in that healing. The greatest problem in medical history comes face to face with the greatest opportunity American doctors ever had. Up against the job of providing medical care for an eventual 20 million veterans, a grateful public is giving the Veterans Administration the means to accomplish that job. It is a task that begins with the recruitment of the best medical personnel obtainable. No, you won't have to worry about regimentation when you join the Veterans Administration. Just remember that you're dealing with civilians. As a matter of fact, your patients are more insistent upon being civilians than most civilians are. The relationship between the doctors and the patients in our hospitals is something of which we are very proud. Uh, oh, gentlemen, uh, this is Dr. Hawley, the chief medical director for the Veterans Administration. As you probably know, Dr. Hawley is the man principally responsible for the development of our new medical program. These gentlemen, sir, are doctors just getting out of the service. I've been answering some of their specific questions about the work that we do in the Veterans Administration, but I wonder if you'd mind giving them a glimpse of our overall medical picture. Yes, sit down, gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen, the law establishing a Department of Medicine and Surgery in the Veterans Administration, which the President signed early in January of 1946, is the finest charter ever granted to a government medical service. For the first time, we are able to classify people instead of positions to be filled by people. There are no limitations upon the number of doctors, dentists, and nurses we can employ in any grade. We can offer salaries based upon the training and the experience of professional people, rather than salaries fixed for the various positions in the service. These salaries are the highest ever offered medical people by our government. They are higher than the average paid for full-time positions in our medical schools. In addition to the better salaries, 
Security in old age is ensured by retirement benefits. Since our physicians are furnished with all their professional equipment, including libraries and other adjuncts essential to the private practice of medicine, and since they do not have to maintain their own offices and office help, it has been estimated conservatively that the salary offered in the medical service of the Veterans Administration to well-qualified specialists is the equivalent of an income of $20,000 a year in private practice. But we are not interested in physicians who would be influenced heavily by financial rewards. We have something much better to offer them, the opportunity to practice the highest standard of medicine, to teach younger physicians, and to keep fully abreast of the advances in medicine. Within a very short time, the majority of our hospitals will be associated with medical schools and other teaching centers. The opportunities for research will be almost unlimited. No other full-time medical service offers comparable opportunities for professional advancement. To those loyal physicians, dentists, and nurses who have served the veterans for years without much encouragement, this new department brings advantages long denied them. We shall give them every opportunity to increase their professional stature and to advance in the service. We have employed outstanding medical men as consultants on a part-time basis. We have established residencies in a number of Veterans Administration hospitals, and we shall establish many more. We shall train hundreds of doctors in the various specialties of medicine. In cooperation with the medical profession of the country, we are expanding outpatient medical service for the veteran in his own community. As far as facilities are concerned, we expect to have nearly 200 hospitals functioning within the next several years. The designs will be of the very best. Much of the construction will be handled by Army engineers. The equipment will be the finest that money can buy. Moreover, we're insisting that our new hospitals be located close to medical schools or other medical centers. This will guarantee the most advanced consulting and research service and the best possible break for both the VA patient and the VA doctor. When you stop to consider, gentlemen, that by 1975 we expect to have around 300,000 beds, you can appreciate what we mean when we say that right now we are laying the groundwork for the greatest medical program in the history of the world. And gentlemen, it's not only going to be the greatest, it's also going to be the best. We mean to give medical care second to none. We are absolutely sincere about this. It's simple logic that to give the best medical care, we're going to have to staff our hospitals with the best medical personnel. We're not kidding ourselves. We know that we have opportunities of a standard the medical profession never saw before. Gentlemen, we sincerely believe the doctor has those opportunities in the Veterans Administration's new program. I'll not go further into detail. I'll leave that to Dr. Willard here. Very well, sir. With your permission, gentlemen, let's look for a moment at the hospital location side of our program. Naturally, we must first of all take into account the distribution of veterans throughout the country. We find that except for a slightly larger than average veteran population in California, the ratio of veterans to non-veterans is comparatively constant throughout the country. Our objective is to see that no area is less well served from a medical standpoint than any other area. But that means going much farther than merely making our hospitals conveniently accessible to veterans. It is equally important to have those hospitals accessible to the best practitioners, teachers, and facilities in civil medicine. The hospital is built with the future in mind. Each design will reflect the most modern techniques and equipment. Thus, we will have a hospital not only properly equipped, but also a hospital which, because of its location, is properly served by consultants, teachers, visiting staffs, and research laboratories. 
The medical schools are solidly in favor of this type of cooperation. Without exception, every Class A medical school whose location fits our requirements has agreed to work with us. It helps us, and it helps them. The motivating force behind this mutual help is our system of deans' committees. These committees are composed of the deans and key faculty members of the medical schools near any given Veterans Administration hospital. They not only will establish the medical standards for that particular hospital, but they also check continually on the professional qualifications of the personnel. It follows that those dean's committees can channel their best graduates into residency or consultant connections with the VA hospital. There, under ideal conditions, they can do postgraduate work leading to passing the examinations of the medical profession's specialty boards. A specialty rating, incidentally, carries with it a 25% increase in pay for the VA doctor. Now that we've mentioned specialties, Let's look for a moment at the way the Department of Medicine and Surgery in the Veterans Administration is organized. VA medical policies are not established by one individual. They come from consultations of the best civil medical minds in the United States. They represent the most progressive thinking in their respective fields. General surgery, thoracic surgery, plastic surgery, ophthalmology, radiology, gynecology, urology, neurosurgery, anesthesiology, general medicine, dermatology, syphilology, neuropsychiatry, tuberculosis. Individually and collectively, the various divisions of VA medicine and surgery benefit immeasurably by the planning and advice of these consultants. The teamwork is something of which both the Veterans Administration and the civil medical profession may well be proud. The Veterans Administration has set itself to meet squarely the medical job ahead. In every phase of that job, the challenge is great. Psychiatric care, for example, in the handling of neuropsychiatric cases developing from World War II, medical science is confronted with the greatest challenge in its history. By the year 1950, veterans' hospitals will be caring for more than 70,000 neuropsychiatric patients, and this in addition to the many more thousands being handled throughout patient service and mental hygiene clinics. There are more veterans hospitalized for mental troubles than for all other reasons put together. Utilizing the best civil facilities and teachers, the Veterans Administration Department of Medicine and Surgery has tackled the neuropsychiatric problem with all the energy and thoroughness it demands. The need for neuropsychiatric specialists is being met by a long-range training program second to none. The trainee, his schooling conducted in the best NP institutes and hospitals, gets the finest possible education in all phases of psychiatry. Well paid while he learns, he spends at least 50% of his time working with veterans. Advanced training is not only provided for, but also encouraged. As with other VA specialists, the psychiatrist's pay is increased 25% when he passes his board examination. Co-equal with training in the VA's program is NP research. The advances in this field made during the war by the armed services were phenomenal. These advances, molded and tempered by the field's leading specialists, medical schools and medical centers, form much of the basis for the VA's proposed research program. This integration of the basic elements of the resultful NP program finds an outlet in Veterans Administration hospitals and clinics. Here, every effort is being made to give the NP specialist the tools and the facilities he needs in practical application. This permits the psychiatrist, the psychiatric social worker, and the psychologist working together as a team to give proper authority to what may be revealed by electroencephalographic, X-ray, and other modern diagnostic apparatus. 
Similarly, no matter what course of treatment is dictated by the diagnosis, the VA program makes every effort to supply the necessary personnel and equipment. Conceivably, the treatment course will give prominence not only to individual therapy, but also to group therapy, as well as to insulin, shock, and hydrotherapy. Facilities are also available for occupational therapy in numerous forms, as well as a wide range of beneficial socializing therapy activities. The Veterans Administration is well aware that it is in the preventive stages that much of the progress against mental diseases will be made. The NP program is aimed squarely at keeping the veteran from ever needing hospital care. For that reason, individual and group preventive work, reflected primarily in mental hygiene clinics and outpatient service, looms large in the VA neuropsychiatry program. For any worker in the field of veterans' mental troubles, the final and crowning satisfaction comes from his opportunity for following up any case. Few, if any, doctors in civil practice can study their patients as thoroughly or as long. Paperwork is held to a minimum in veterans' hospitals, but the medical history of each veteran is always complete and always available. And so, although the obstacles are nowhere greater than in neuropsychiatry, the Veterans Administration in its aim to offer its neuropsychiatrists the very best in research, training, diagnostic treatment, and follow-up opportunities is confident it can turn these obstacles into victorious results. In the fields of general medicine and surgery, the veteran problem is also great. It is estimated that from 1942 to 1950, there will be 269% increase in general medicine and surgical cases, so that by 1950, some 60,500 will be hospitalized. Many of the thousands of hospitalized older veterans are now in the hospitals because of degenerative or malignant diseases. To them have been added the tremendous load in the varied medical difficulties of men who in World War II served in every quarter of the earth, sea, and sky. The Veterans Administration must meet this new burden with the wide range of special skills it demands. It calls for pathological conferences and consultations of the highest order, regular on-the-spot instruction by the best specialists available, endless research. It calls for every conceivable facility for keeping up to date, whether by laboratory work, by time off to go to school, by attendance at medical meetings, or by the exchange of ideas in special groups. And it calls for special facilities. It may concern any of a myriad of surgical problems. Anesthesiology, neurosurgery, urology, radiology, ophthalmology, plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery, laryngology, even gynecology. Or it may concern any branch of general medicine from dermatology and syphilology to allergies and tropical diseases. No matter what the ailment or where the hospital, there has been set up a variety of services and auxiliary benefits wider than any other medical program has even contemplated. And because of those services, because of that extra attention, because he is not limited by his patient's financial standing, the VA doctor, no matter where he is or what his problem, always has the satisfaction of knowing that the time and the tools to solve that problem are or will be available. Nor does the challenge end there. Tuberculosis, for example, on June 30th, 1942, there were 5,090 veterans hospitalized for tuberculosis. The incidence of tuberculosis among veterans rose sharply after the First World War. It is showing the same tendencies now. Because of the much greater number of World War II veterans, the most conservative estimates show that by 1950, some 15,000 will be hospitalized. Perhaps it developed after the war with Spain. Perhaps it followed service on the Western Front in World War I. Perhaps it was the ravages of the Ardennes winter 
or submarine service in the Pacific in World War II that lowered resistance to infection by the ubiquitous tubercle bacillus. Whatever the predisposing factor, every veteran suffering from tuberculosis deserves the benefits of careful diagnosis, patient research, sympathetic treatment, modern methods of rehabilitation. The story is the same throughout the specialties and services embraced by the VA's medical program. The objective, medical service second to none. The solution, facilities and personnel second to none. Whether it be the VA's expanding outpatient service, under which contracts with medical societies permit the veteran to be served in his own community by the doctor of his choice, the VA's nursing service, which is making full use of those whose war experience qualifies them ideally to work with veterans, the dental service, an integral part of veterans' care, the treating of the growing number of women patients, the dietetic service, the pharmacy service, social services, or any of the dozens of activities that come under the heading of auxiliary or special aids, recreation, entertainment, canteen facilities, athletics, whatever the value, the fact that they are to be available will mean much to the patient. Indirectly, it means just as much to the VA doctor. Acute medical care is only part of the VA's medical assignment. Rehabilitation, both mental and physical, is an equally important mission. It is far more than a matter of supplying the proper prosthetic device for an amputee. Rehabilitation, as the Veterans Administration defines it, means every possible effort to return the veteran educationally, occupationally, and socially to his rightful place among his fellow men. Thus, the VA's rehabilitation program is one of adjunctive therapy geared inseparably to medical care. The excellent pioneering by the armed forces in rehabilitation is today finding in the Veterans Administration its best proving ground. Here, physical and mental rehabilitation research is constantly expanding. At the same time, the experience gained in World War II is being put to practical use. In the VA's program, the teamwork among the doctors of physical medicine, the physical therapist, and the occupational therapist progresses under ideal circumstances. Nowhere is there any lag between acute medical care and the patient's rehabilitation. As soon as he is well enough, he goes into corrective physical retraining, educational retraining, or shop work and industrial therapy. He becomes not merely a new man physically and mentally, but more important, he becomes a useful, self-respecting, well-adjusted member of the society for which he gave so much. The pride of achievement of the Veterans Administration's doctor begins when he is selected for a VA appointment. In the selection process, professional merit is the first and only consideration. All inquiries and applications, whether sent to the central office in Washington or to one of the VA's dean's committees, branch or regional offices or hospitals, are carefully evaluated. Preferably, the application is discussed in a personal interview. At any rate, when the papers are completed and checked for basic qualifications, an estimate of possible grade is made. The Veterans Administration doesn't set up a job and grade that job. It grades the man on his experience and training. He may qualify for any one of six different grades. They run from junior grade, for which the principal prerequisite is a year's internship, to the chief grade, which requires 12 years of practice plus varied experience, preferably as chief of service in a large general hospital. In the matter of locations, the choice is as wide as possible. After indicating the branch of service he wants, the applicant talks over assignment and location with the assistant director for that service. Action on the papers is then taken by the professional standards board, one of whose members is the representative of the service the applicant has chosen. 
After the board's recommendations are approved by the chief medical director or his designates, a telegram advises the applicant of the offer the Veterans Administration is willing to make. He replies by telegram. If his answer is one of acceptance, he is sent a letter of appointment, together with the notice of where and when he is to report. All final administrative actions, including oath of office and so forth, are handled at the station after he reports for duty. The Veterans Administration is convinced that pleasant surroundings are just as important to the doctor, nurse, or dentist as they are to the patient. Whether it be a matter of as regular hours as possible, of recreation, of enjoying the companionship of men with similar interests, of being relieved of administrative paperwork in order to give the patient the time he deserves, of finding desirable living quarters, either on the station or close by, or of helping with the everyday needs of the wives and children of its hospital personnel, the Veterans Administration feels it all to be a contribution to the success of its medical program. In the words of General Omar Bradley, head of the Veterans Administration, We who have seen him in battle can be forever proud to serve the American serviceman after his discharge. It has been a great satisfaction to me to note among our returning doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel a greater social consciousness, a broader point of view that moves them toward an interest in more people than is usually possible in private practice. We welcome those men and women, doctors, nurses, dentists, and others, to join the many fine professional people who already have given years to the care and healing of America's veterans. The task is great. The opportunities are just as great. Only by making sure the opportunities are second to none can we reach the goal to which we are dedicated, medical service second to none. <laughs>